I'd rather be the U.S. than China. China's in even worse shape for different reasons. Um, it's not so much interest rate policy, although they're they're subject to global interest rate policy and exchange rates coming from the Fed. But uh, you can see it in real estate. It's a full scale collapse. Uh, they're, they're propping it up, but, um, the, the, the buyers aren't interested. In other words, the, the Chinese government is telling the banks to lend money to real estate developers who can't finish housing. Well, that sounds good. It's like, okay, here's some money, finish the housing. But the buyers are not flocking in. The buyers have been burned. They're shying away from that asset class. They want to increase cash. They're looking at other asset classes. They don't have a lot of choices because, China has very strict capital controls. They're trying to get their money out by means legal and illegal. Uh, they're buying gold when they can. Um, but uh, as I say, they may not have a lot of choices, but even money in the bank looks pretty good compared to what's going on in real estate. The problem is too big. The bubble is too large. It's gone on for too long. We don't hear about it the same way we did about the Japanese real estate bubble in 1989, 1990. That was an epic crash. Uh, Japan is still not recovered. I remember in the 90s, Early 2000s, they talked about the lost decade. Well, try three lost decades. That's going into a fourth. Uh, that's Japan, you know, eight or I've lost count, actually, eight or nine recessions since 1989. But it's really just one long depression. That's the way to understand the Japanese economy. China's going into something like that. We don't hear much about it because they're not transparent. They lie about their numbers. You, you need to look at private sources and other use other, other analytic tools to understand what's going on there. Uh, but they've got um, you know, drops in consumption, industrial output, real estate's collapsing, uh, their price indices are collapsing, all this infl- fear of inflation. It's been around, it's real, but it's now turning around very quickly. And you can see that in China. China's gone through something that the world has never seen. Uh, it is a, they're going to lose 600 million people in the next 50 to 70 years. This is a demographic implosion. This is worse than the Black Death. Of course, the Black Death uh, killed somewhere between a third and half the population of Europe in the uh, 14th century. Um, uh, It was a good time for uh, for labor, by the way. Uh, The the labor was so scarce that returns to labor went up versus returns to capital uh, because there weren't enough workers. Uh, But that's the only thing uh, that can come close even the uh, you know the Spanish flu of 1919 killed about no no one's certain of the number but but between 100 million and maybe over 200 million people the Thirty Years War was certainly you know in the early 17th century was certainly highly destructive but what's going on in China now is is worse than any of those things um, you know it has to do with math, you know simple demographic math uh, the key number is 2.1 two people have to produce 2.1 children a you know, man and woman or you can say per woman if you if you want uh have to produce 2.1 children to keep the population constant why not two why not two producing two the answer is infant mortality and those who don't make it to uh adulthood and can continue the uh repopulation of the planet uh if you will but they're not even close to that. They're well below two. And by the way, so is so is the rest of the world. So is Australia and the US and Western Europe and a lot of other places. This is a global phenomenon, but it's particularly acute in China. Maybe the case that China's uh replacement rate is uh or or birth rate is actually one. Uh it has to be two point one to maintain. It could be one or lower. Uh this is a, a demographic implosion, unlike anything ever seen uh, anyone's ever seen. It also has a dynamic. You can't reverse it very quickly. It, it feeds on itself, as I was talking about inflation earlier. So uh, this is going to continue for 50 to 75 years. Uh, they're going to lose 600 million people. There are a lot of definitions of GDP, a four or five part definition. They're more complex calculations. But there's one really simple definition. It only has two factors, population and productivity. How many people are working and how productive are they? That's nominal GDP. It's, that's one definition of gross GDP uh, or, or nominal uh, GDP. Well, if your population is dropping from 1.4 billion to 800 million, you're losing 600 million people. Uh, and then what about productivity? Well, the other thing that's going on is China's population is aging very quickly. So you get a population set people in the 70s, 80s, and 90s uh, with very large amounts of um cognitive decline, dementia. Uh, obviously, there's no productivity there, but it's worse than that because then you look at the shrinking population between the ages of 25 and 54. It's called their prime working age. More and more of those people are going to have to be involved in elder care. They're going to have to be basically caretakers or caregivers 
for the older population I described. A very worthy job, but not one that lends itself to productivity gains. Um, bathing hasn't changed in about 5,000 years. Robots don't do baths. Um, the only real innovation in bathing in uh, between 1870 and 1940, we did see the rise of indoor plumbing and hot water. That's good. Um, I, I enjoy both, but, um, but that's it. We, I can't think of any other bathing innovations, uh, in, in the last several millennia. So if you have a shrinking working age population, a rising older population, high degree of cognitive decline and a big slice of the working age population having to provide elder care or be caregivers for the older population. Tell me where your industrial output's coming from. Tell me where your productivity is coming from. And, uh, sorry if I mentioned this already, but 50% of the water in China is poisoned, uh, because of, you know, just their industrial practices. You know, they, they, uh, if you're a gold miner in Australia, I've invested gold mines around the world. I know that places like Canada, the U.S. and, uh, Australia, if you use cyanide to leach the gold, and that's a very common technique, you have to account for every, you know, microgram. You, you know, whatever you put in, you got to take out, weigh it, dispose of it properly. In China, they just dump it into the rivers. And so the rivers are poison. Um, so China is, uh, uh, an economic, demographic, industrial, moral, religious, uh, wasteland and, uh, will suffer. It's, it's already in a recession just to, just to cut to the chase. Again, they lie about their statistics. So, so here you have the two largest economies in the world, U.S. and China. U.S. is slowly going into what I expect will be a severe recession. China is in a century long decline, uh, unlike one that the world has ever seen. Um, that could eventually lead to social unrest and a regime change, but let's not count on that in the short run. Just expect China to, um, to shrink and become more autarkic, decoupled from the Western world and, uh, certainly not be a, a source of growth. Taiwan semiconductor manufacturing company, the largest and most sophisticated semiconductor manufacturing in the world. And semiconductors are in everything. It's not just computers. There are 1400 semiconductors in an automobile. Uh, there's a semiconductor or more in your, your dishwasher, your refrigerator, your washing machine. They're everywhere. Internet of things. We all understand that. Um, so TSMC based in Taiwan. Uh, the United States has a military doctrine called the broken nest theory. And what it says is that if China, well, it comes from a Chinese proverb, ironically, and it says, if the nest is broken, how can the eggs survive? Um, and what it means is that if China invades Taiwan, and I'm not forecasting an invasion, could happen though, um, we or the Taiwanese will very quickly destroy all the semiconductor manufacturers in Taiwan. We'll just blow them up and China won't get anything. They'll have the broken nest. Taiwan Semiconductor knows this. Um, they talk to the U.S. intelligence and military. It's going to get worse. Inflation's here to stay. Um, commodities are going to boom. Oil prices are going to soar. Bonds are going to crash. And gold has been in a very funny situation, which is the following. Normally, you say, well, if there's inflation coming, why isn't the price of gold going to the moon? And why on earth would gold prices go up if there were deflation or disinflation? The answer is that you have to look at the yield of maturity on the 10-year treasury note. That's our benchmark security. Um, a lot of people look at LIBOR, but I'm like, no, if you're making investment decisions, you're buying a house, you're doing capital investing, these are all five, 10, sometimes 20 year decisions. The 10 year note is the right benchmark for those large long-term investments. Um, well, that's an alternative place to put money. You can buy gold, you can buy a 10 year treasury note. So what's been true since last summer is as the yield to maturity on the 10 year note goes up, it, that strengthens the dollar and gold prices have gone down because the dollar price of gold is just another cross rate, just another cross exchange rate. So a stronger dollar means a lower dollar price for gold. But if the yield of maturity in the 10 year note goes down, then that weakens the dollar and the dollar price of gold goes up because a weaker dollar means a higher dollar price for gold. So curiously, the price of gold is being driven not by inflation in the abstract, but by the strength of the dollar, which is reciprocal to the interest rate on the 10-year treasury notes. But here's what has changed. I talk about gold bull markets and gold bear markets, and I start my analysis in 1971, and I don't have to go through all, the, all that data, but that's, that's how I think about it. And you're like, well, Jim, why 1971? Why not 
before that. And of course, 1971, it was when Nixon stopped redeeming dollars for gold. Americans couldn't even own gold in 1971. It was contraband. It was like drugs or you know machine guns or something. But foreign trading partners could redeem dollars for gold up until 1971. And then Nixon said no more. And then that was the final decoupling. But prior to that, gold was actually money. In other words, uh, with under Bretton Woods, gold was pegged at $35 an ounce. Prior to Bretton Woods, it was pegged at $20.67 an ounce. We've gone back to the 1920s or earlier through most of the 19th century. For the United States and sterling, I think it was $4.75. It could be off a little bit on that, but you know, four, four pounds and, and change. And as late as World War I, say 1913, if you were a Brit and you were getting on the steamer from London to you know, at the time Bombay, today Mumbai, you took a purse of uh, British sovereigns. British sovereign is it's about uh, about eight grams, a little bit less. You know, it's not an ounce; it's a quarter ounce because an ounce is almost too much. Even even today, what are you going to do with a one ounce coin? It's worth you know almost two thousand uh, dollars. You know, you're not going to use that for to buy a pack of gum. But in the day, there was the quarter ounce, which today would be, you know, like a $500 bill. So it's still a significant amount of money. Uh, but you could get on the steamer in Southampton and get off in Bombay at the time. And it was money good. You could take that British sovereign and spend it anywhere. And same thing in Singapore and Hong Kong and Japan or all around the world. So gold was actually money. So it wasn't a question of, oh, what's the exchange rate? It was the gold was the money. And people thought about it by weight. They said, oh, a sovereign? That's eight grams of gold. So that's worth, you know, that'll get you whatever. So, uh, and that was true throughout history. And so it's really only since 1971, when we decoupled completely in terms of an exchange rate that you have to think about, you know, well, what's the dollar price of gold? Because it's not fixed. But okay, well, what happened to the memory? What happened to the 3,000 years I just talked about? Well, the answer is it happened in stages and it actually took, it took about 75 years. So it began in 1914. 1914 was the outbreak of World War One. Everybody needed gold. There was a, there was a run on gold um, and countries needed gold because they knew they would need gold to pay for the war to try to win the war. Whether it didn't matter if you're Germany, UK or whoever. And remember, the United States was neutral. The United States did not get in the war until 1917. The war started in 1914. So for those first two and a half years, New York was a money center to all of Europe, to, to all the belligerents. Uh, so everyone scrambled for gold. So if you were a citizen, they asked you to bring your gold to the bank and they gave you paper money. And but people did it out of a patriotic, it's existential. War is not a normal market. You're gonna, if you lose the war, you got bigger problems than your gold. And so people put the gold in the banks. What did the banks do? They melted it down and made 400 ounce bars. And they said, don't worry, your money's backed by the gold, but keep using that paper money, uh, but it's redeemable for gold. But oh, by the way, they're 400 ounce bars. Nobody walks around with a 400 ounce bar in her purse. I'm sure you've seen one and I have as well. They're they're heavy, they weigh about 35 pounds. You don't walk around with them. So all of a sudden the, the gold was still there and the paper money was backed by gold in theory, but the gold had disappeared into the banks. That's step one. Step two, and this happened in the 1930s, the central banks took the gold from the commercial banks. So first the commercial banks took the gold from the people. Then the central banks took the gold from the commercial banks and the Federal Reserve System sold all the banks. Hey, send your, send your gold to the regional Federal Reserve Bank. And of course, most of it went to the Federal Reserve Bank in New York. So now it's not even in the banks anymore, right? But you're still walking around thinking your paper money is somehow attached to gold, but people haven't seen gold for a while, uh, unless you're a collector. Step three, uh, the United States Treasury and the finance ministries took it from the central bank. The 1934, the United, the United States Treasury seized the gold of the Federal Reserve System. Bearing in mind, the Federal Reserve System is privately owned. And they gave them a gold certificate. And you go to the Federal Reserve System website today and you know hunt around a little bit on the links and find the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve and it's there. And look on the, look in the assets and the first line item is gold certificate, and it's valued at $11 billion. But that's because they value the gold at $42 an ounce. If you, and I've revalued it, the answer is that today's market, that that 11 billion is actually worth 470 billion. So the Fed has a hidden asset of 450 odd billion that's not on the balance sheet, represented by a gold certificate. But it's not the gold, the treasury has the gold, and by the way, where do we keep our gold? I'm talking about the United States. The Treasury owns the gold. The Fed has a paper certificate. The gold is on two army bases, West Point and Fort Knox. 
So I would say the army has the gold. Gold has gone from citizens walking around having it in, in your purse to commercial banks, to central banks, to finance ministries held on an army base. It's still there. The gold didn't disappear, um, but nobody talks about it and everyone pretends it's not money, but of course it's money. Um, but but meanwhile, what's happened to this, the, the civilian population, the citizens? We stopped talking about it. We stopped saying it. We stopped learning about it. I remind people, I, I just showing my age, but my I got a graduate degree in international economics and I was class of 74. But that was the year the IMF demonetized gold. But I was the last class that was taught gold in an academic setting as a monetary asset. Uh, if you know if you're younger than I am and you know anything about gold, you're either self-taught or you went to mining college because they just stopped teaching it. So now we have two generations of scholars who never learned a thing about gold. So they they hid it, they took it, they buried it, they stopped teaching it, they stopped talking about it, and they pretended it's not there. Meanwhile, it is there. And Russia is a good example of someone who takes it seriously. In the U.S., we still have our 8,000 tons, 8,133 tons. We haven't given it away. We haven't sold any gold since 1980, by the way. We got the British to do it. We got everyone else to do our dirty work. The British sold more than half, no, seriously, the British sold more than half their gold. The Swiss sold 1,000 tons. The IMF sold uh, 400 tons in 2010. That was the last significant sell by a, a, you know, a monetary institution. Uh, Australia sold most of theirs. Canada sold most of theirs. If I were one of these other countries, I would say to the U.S., hey, why don't you sell some of your gold? But the U.S. doesn't. We haven't sold it an ounce since 1980. We're in a recession. I mean, it's not coming. We're in it. It's a triple greatest bubble of all time times three in the sense that it's um, real estate, stocks, and, and other asset classes. The largest, most sophisticated, biggest player, real money market in the world is telling you that the Fed's going to blink, that they're going to raise rates, but then things are going to get so bad, they're going to have to cut rates. And that's why we can see a liquidity crisis and a very severe recession coming well in advance. I haven't really seen the real, the, the market collapse, stock market collapse that I would expect in association with a severe recession has not happened yet. This is just going to play out and it'll get worse as the year goes on. Inflation was going up long before the war in Ukraine started. So you, if everything is great until February 27th and then Russia invades and then all of a sudden the inflation goes up, all right, let's talk about it. But that's not true. This, this inflation goes back to... Uh, late 2021 it was persistent in the fall we all remember the fed and the treasury saying transitory 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 and then finally i think jay powell was testifying for congress he said it's time to retire the word transitory so that was his way of throwing in the towel and janet yellen admitted she was mistaken also this is going to be part of what throws the economy into a severe recession they're raising rates and inflation is coming down but what they don't know is are interest rates coming down because they're raising rates or have they already hit the terminal rate and it's coming down on its own and they just don't know it and that's a big deal because if they're at the terminal rate and they just don't know it and they keep tightening which they are they are going to over tighten probably already have the energy prices are going up because there's a war with russia well uh i wonder why that is well the reason uh is not because putin invaded ukraine it's because the u.s counterattacked with financial sanctions now bear in mind, go go back to January 21st, 2021, when Biden was sworn in as president and then went back to the White House. What was the first thing he did? He closed the Keystone XL pipeline. This is a pipeline that would bring oil from Alberta, Canada into the United States where it would connect at a hub, uh, I believe it's in Kansas, but you know somewhere in the central United States. And then the hub distributes it to the entire country. So he shut down that pipeline, uh, which, curtail the supply of oil from Canada. And then we end up with you know, oil prices doubling or tripling really from $40 to $120 in, in under a year. The other source of inflation is on the demand side. So you have what's called cost push inflation. That's where you know supplies choked off or there's an embargo or there's a shortage of natural disaster. A lot of things it's coming from the supply side and demand is inelastic. So you just pay up or you know kind of do without. Um, but the demand side is much more psychological. That's called uh, demand pull inflation. That's when consumers behave the way I described. And as I said, I lived in the 70s. 
um, where, you know, hey, I better buy it today, I better buy it now. You're pulling all this demand forward and bidding up prices because you're worried that it's going to get even worse. So inflation is coming down, no question. But is it because the Fed has continued to raise rates or is it because the Fed has hit a terminal rate and all they have to do is nothing, just pause, as they put it, and inflation will come down where they want. Uh, the market believes we're at the terminal rate. The Fed should just stop right now, leave it alone, sooner than later pivot to, uh, that's the new buzzword, pivot to rate cuts. And it's the anticipation of those rate cuts that has Wall Street all spun up. They get the pom-poms out and saying, buy stocks, buy tech, because the Fed's going to cut rates. The Fed does not see it that way at all. Um, the Fed says, um, yeah, we're raising rates. Inflation's coming down, but we're not at the terminal rate. We'll kind of know when we see it, but they think it's probably five and a quarter. That's a very good estimate based on what the Fed has said themselves. I started my career uh, in banking in 1976. And uh, so I started, I remember my, uh, my wife and I used to kid each other. She was in advertising, I was in banking and the inflation was so bad. You'd get a raise every like four or five months and you didn't have to ask. They would just give it to you because they knew that you were going to quit if, if, if uh, they didn't keep up. So she would get a raise and she was making more than I was at the time. So we'd go out to dinner and then I would get a raise and I was making more than she was. So we would just tease each other about that. But that's how it was. Um, and the psychology was, you know, if you needed a whatever, you know, TV set or refrigerator, new car, whatever, you say, I better buy it now because the price is going to be higher. If I wait a month or two months, the price is going to run away from me. So it, it had huge behavioral uh, effects. Between 77 and 81, so that five-year period, the dollar lost 50% of its purchasing power. Not 15, 50. During the first part of the Great Depression, you know, unemployment was high, uh, output was dropping, trade was dropping. It was a very, very bad time, no doubt about it. But not everybody was out of work. Not everybody was poor. There were a lot of people with a lot of money uh, at the time. But it was felt that being ostentatious was poor form. It's like, you know, okay, I'm lucky I have a job. I've got some money, but I'm not going to buy a new car, or buy a big house or flash it around or whatever, because it's really not considerate of all the people who actually are have fallen on hard times. Well, that was the narrative, but it's the worst possible economic advice because it's precisely the fact that people with the money should keep spending that kind of can boost the economy out of the depression. So by people saying, well, even though I have the money, I'm not going to spend it because it's poor form, uh, we're actually prolonging the Great Depression. Today, we are starting with the cost push inflation, and mainly the price of energy, but the price of food is a big factor. And of course they're related. You know, it's like, oh, well, it's like, here's the energy, here's the food. You know, where do you think the food comes from? You, to get the food, you got to feed the pigs and cows. What do you feed them? You feed them corn. Oh, how do you get corn? Well, you grow it on a farm. You need nitrogen fertilizer. You need diesel in your tractors. Uh, you get the food, you got to put it in a truck to get it from point A to point B. That, requires diesel, the higher the diesel price, the higher the cost of food because you're moving it by truck, et cetera. So these things, as I say, are linked. Um, but, but food prices are going up substantially. And you can't, the two things you can't do without are gas in the car and food. So, so you have that, um, that, that cost push inflation. We're not quite at the stage where it's demand pull. We're not quite at the stage where individual consumers are behaving the way I described in the 1970s saying, hey, better better spend the money fast because it's it's losing value. This damage was self-inflicted, but don't be misled by the headlines because they're, again, this narrative, but they're, they're not actually uh, doing it. So the point being, the price increase and in inflation in the U.S. has very little to do with Putin and everything to do with the U.S. handicapping its own energy industry, um, begging dictators for oil, uh, and the influence of the climate alarmists. And by the way, that whole crowd, uh, want higher gas prices. They want gas to be seven, eight, nine dollars a gallon because they expect that that will accelerate the transfer to electric vehicles and make the electric vehicle more attractive relative to the internal combustion engine. Now that's another fantasy. It will never happen. But meanwhile, they're destroying the US economy in pursuit of an ideological point that will never actually happen. It's going to get worse. Inflation is here to stay. Um, commodities are going to boom. Oil prices are going to soar. 
bonds are going to crash. And gold has been in a very funny situation, which is the following. Normally, you say, well, if there's inflation coming, why isn't the price of gold going to the moon? And why on earth would gold prices go up if there were deflation or disinflation? The answer is that you have to look at the yield of maturity on the 10-year treasury note. That's our benchmark security. Um, a lot of people look at LIBOR, but I'm like, no, if you're making investment decisions, you're buying a house, you're doing capital investing, these are all five, 10, sometimes 20 year decisions. The 10 year note is the right benchmark for those large long-term investments. Um, well, that's an alternative for August of 2020 is as the yield to maturity on the 10 year note goes up, it, that strengthens the dollar and gold prices have gone down because the dollar price of gold is just another cross rate, just another cross exchange rate. So a stronger dollar means a lower dollar price for gold. But if the yield of maturity in the 10 year note goes down, then that weakens the dollar and the dollar price of gold goes up because a weaker dollar means a higher dollar price for gold. So curiously, the price of gold is being driven not by inflation in the abstract, but by the strength of the dollar, which is reciprocal to the interest rate on the 10 year treasury notes. But here's what has changed. I talk about gold bull markets and gold bear markets. And I start my analysis in 1971, and I don't have to go through all, the, all that data, but that's that's how I think about it. And you're like, well, Jim, why 1971? Why not before that? And of course, 1971, it was when Nixon stopped redeeming dollars for gold. Americans couldn't even own gold in 1971. It was contraband, it was like drugs or you know machine guns or something. But foreign trading partners could redeem dollars for gold up until 1971, and then Nixon said no more. And then that was the final decoupling. But prior to that, gold was actually money. In other words, uh, with under Bretton Woods, gold was pegged at $35 an ounce. Prior to Bretton Woods, it was pegged at $20.67 an ounce. We've gone back to the 1920s or earlier through much of the 19th century. For the United States and sterling, I think it was $4.75. It could be off a little bit on that, but it was four, four pounds and, and change. And as late as World War I, say 1913, if you were a Brit and you were getting on the steamer from London to you know, at the time, Bombay, today, Mumbai, you took a purse of uh, British sovereigns. British sovereign is, is about uh, about eight grams, a little bit less. You know, it's not an ounce, it's a quarter ounce because an ounce is almost too much. Even even today, what are you gonna do with a one ounce coin that's worth, you know, almost $2,000? Uh, you know, you're not gonna use that for to buy a pack of gum. But in the day, there was the quarter ounce, which today would be, you know, like a $500 bill. So it's still a significant amount of money. Uh, but you could get on the steamer in Southampton and get off in Bombay at the time. And it was money good. You could take that British sovereign and spend it anywhere. And same thing in Singapore and Hong Kong and Japan or all around the world. So gold was actually money. So it wasn't a question of, oh, what's the exchange rate? It was the gold was the money. And people thought about it by weight. They said, oh, a sovereign, that's eight grams of gold. So that's worth, you know, that'll get you whatever. So, uh, and that was true throughout history. And so it's really only since 1971, when we decoupled completely in terms of an exchange rate that you have to think about, you know, well, what's the dollar price of gold? Because it's not fixed. But okay, well, what happened to the memory? What happened to the 3000 years I just talked about? Well, the answer is it happened in stages and it actually took, it took about 75 years. So it began in 1914. 1914 was the outbreak of World War I. Everybody needed gold. There was a, there was a run on gold um, and countries needed gold because they knew they would need gold to pay for the war to try to win the war. Well, it didn't matter if you're Germany, UK or whoever. And remember, the United States was neutral. The United States did not get in the war until 1917. The war started in 1914. So for those first two and a half years, New York was a money center to all of Europe, to, to all the belligerents. Uh, so everyone scrambled for gold. So if you were a citizen, they asked you to bring your gold to the bank and they gave you paper money. And but people did it out of a patriotic, it's existential. War is not a normal market. You're gonna, if you lose the war, you got bigger problems than your gold. And so people put the gold in the banks. What did the banks do? They melted it down and made 400 ounce bars. And they said, don't worry, your money's backed by the gold, but keep using that paper money, uh, but it's redeemable for gold. But oh, by the way, they're 400 ounce bars. Nobody walks around with a 400 ounce bar in her purse. I'm sure you've seen one and I have as well. They're they're heavy, they weigh about 35 pounds. You don't walk around with them. So all of a sudden the, the gold was still there and the paper money was backed by gold in theory, but the gold had disappeared into the banks. That's step one. Step two, 
and this happened in the 1930s, the central banks took the gold from the commercial banks. So first the commercial banks took the gold from the people, then the central banks took the gold from the commercial banks, and the Federal Reserve System told all the banks, hey, send your, send your gold to the regional Federal Reserve Bank. And of course, most of it went to the Federal Reserve Bank in New York. So now it's not even in the banks anymore, right? But you're still walking around thinking your paper money is somehow attached to gold, but people haven't seen gold for a while, uh, unless you're a collector. Step three, uh, the United States Treasury and the finance ministries took it from the central bank. The 1934, the United, the United States Treasury seized the gold of the Federal Reserve System. Bearing in mind, the Federal Reserve System is privately owned. And they gave them a gold certificate. And you go to the Federal Reserve System website today and you know hunt around a little bit on the links and find the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve, and it's there. And look on the look in the assets. And the first line item is gold certificate. And it's valued at $11 billion. But that's because they value the gold at $42 an ounce. If you, and I've revalued it, the answer is that today's market, that that 11 billion is actually worth 470 billion. So the Fed has a hidden asset of 450 odd billion that's not on the balance sheet represented by a gold certificate. But it's not the gold, the treasury has the gold. And by the way, where do we keep our gold? I'm talking about the United States. The Treasury owns the gold. The Fed has a paper certificate. The gold is on two army bases, West Point and Fort Knox. So I would say the army has the gold. Gold has gone from citizens walking around having it in, in your purse to commercial banks, to central banks, to finance ministries held on an army base. It's still there. The gold didn't disappear, um, but nobody talks about it. And everyone pretends it's not money, but of course it's money. Um, but but meanwhile, what's happened to this, the, the civilian population, the citizens? We stopped talking about it. We stopped saying it. We stopped learning about it. I remind people, I, you know, just showing my age, but my I got a graduate degree in international economics and I was class of 74. But that was the year the IMF demonetized gold. But I was the last class that was taught gold in an academic setting as a monetary asset. Uh, if you know if you're younger than I am and you know anything about gold, you're either self-taught or you went to mining college because they just stopped teaching it. So now we have two generations of scholars who never learned a thing about gold. So they they hit it, they took it, they buried it, they stopped teaching it, they stopped talking about it and they pretended it's not there. Meanwhile, it is there. And Russia is a good example of someone who takes it seriously in the US. We still have our 8,000 tons, 8,133 tons. We haven't given it away. We haven't sold any gold since 1980, by the way. We got the British to do it. We got everyone else to do our dirty work. The British sold more than half, no, seriously, the British sold more than half their gold. The Swiss sold 1,000 tons. The IMF sold uh, 400 tons in 2010. That was the last significant sell by a, a, you know, a monetary institution. Uh, Australia sold most of theirs. Canada sold most of theirs. If I were one of these other countries, I would say to the U.S., hey, why don't you sell some of your gold? But the U.S. doesn't. We haven't sold it an ounce since 1980. Global economy is, is the big topic. That's what we all care about most. But financial markets can come up with their own narratives and go their own way, at least for a while. So you have to, they're not in, in sync. They, they do, they will be in sync eventually, but uh, not always right away. A lot of times the financial markets get ahead of themselves and then they wake up to reality and they oh crash you know correct down so there's a little bit of that going on but in terms of the global economy um i think your use of the word global is very much on point because we are going into or may already be in a global recession now that's rare it's it's rare when hey china japan us germany they're all in recession at the same time but that's what's unfolding that's a big deal uh, well for obvious reasons uh because uh, you know it affects uh, basically everyone but um there's no life preserver there's no you know it's not like china's going to pull us all out of it with cheap exports or or japan's going to you know put the pedal to the metal in terms of fixed uh asset investment uh you know etc so so that's a really bad sign i mean and just to be very specific you know we just saw us fourth quarter GDP grew at a 2.9% annualized rate, people are like, yeah, that's pretty good. Um, and, you know, it's not good by post-1980 standards. It's not good at all by post-World War II standards. But post-2008, yeah, that's not, that's not bad. Uh, again, you have to disaggregate it and you look at what grew. It was uh, inventories were a big contributor. 
uh, and net exports were a big contributor. Um, and a fi- fixed asset investment in particular, there was a big load of, um, uh, aircraft orders for Boeing, which is notoriously lumpy. You know, they, they'll have a big month, blowout month, and then nothing for a couple of months, not nothing, but, you know, s- something very low. So when you look at that, uh, inventories are counted as part of GDP, of course, but it's not necessarily a good thing. If inventories are piling up, it means retailers are not buying. And this kind of goes back to the whole supply chain breakdown of a year ago. That's what my book sold out was about. So you go back to, uh, let's say the spring of 2022. The supply chain had completely fallen apart. And if you were a purchasing manager and you were, you were saying to yourself, um, okay, we're kind of coming out of COVID. We're, we're, we're going to start growing. Uh, but the supply chain is broken. So instead of ordering one, you know, container, I'm going to order three containers because maybe one will get through, you know, through the bottlenecks. I only want one, but I'm going to order three and hope for the best. What happened was some of that, a lot of the stuff was alleviated, not for good reasons, not really for logistical reasons, but because the consumers slowed down a lot beginning in June, partly in reaction to the Fed starting to hike rates in March of uh, 2022. Uh, and then here come the three containers. So at this, at the, at the exact moment when uh, demand destruction is kicking in, your inventory is going to the rafters. So what do retailers do or wholesalers for that matter? But retail, they slash prices that, you know, two for one sales, uh, you know, because inventories are a nightmare for retailers for obvious reasons. Number one, you have to finance them. So they eat up working capital. It could be cash, but now you know, you got a bunch of stuff in the back office. And number two, it just takes up space. I mean, it, it insurance costs and, and other costs like that. But the other thing people kind of underestimate is that like st- uh, fashion, goes, stuff goes out of fashion. You know, ne- last spring's styles are not next spring styles. You still got last spring stuff. Good luck. You know, it's it, we're getting close to spring. So you're dumping that stuff. Um, you know, consumer electronics, uh, you know, you got an iPhone 13. Well, everybody wants an iPhone 14, you know, whatever. I mean, you take the point. So, um, so piling up inventories is a very unhealthy sign. It means the retail sector is drying up. Demand destruction is kicking in. Costs are going up because you got to finance all this stuff and your profit margins are going down. So I don't take a lot of comfort from that. But the other thing, to the extent you can disaggregate monthly data, and there's a lot of monthly data, yeah, 2.9% annualized for the quarter, but it really slowed down in December. Christmas was a disaster. I mean, yeah, people bought stuff for Christmas, but way below expectations. And again, it goes back to piling up the inventory at the worst possible time. So it looks like the U.S. is going into 2023. Possibly recession started in December. If not, we expect it to start soon. But you're seeing the same thing in Europe now. Europe got a break with the weather. Uh, you know, obviously there's a war going on, so that's a big factor. But, um, uh, you know, and natural gas prices, uh, skyrocketed and, uh, and, and oil prices skyrocketed, um, again in mid, uh, 2022. They've come down, but it doesn't mean that, you know, all is well or, or they're out of the woods and there are, there are other things going on. China is a basket case. Um, you know, they went from zero COVID. It was bad public policy and bad health policy. But they did it anyway. So they flipped almost on a dime. So they just turned on a dime and said, okay, let it rip. The the positive let it rip. Let everyone get infected and we'll do the best we can. One of the ways you get through it is by letting rip and you develop what's called herd immunity. And that's what worked in North America and Europe. But the other difference with, between China and Europe and, and the U.S. is that they don't have the healthcare system to deal with it. Our healthcare system, which is pretty good, was strained. Same thing in Europe. China has nowhere near the ICU unit, the ICU units, the oxygen, the treatments, uh, the just the, the professionals, the nurses and doctors, not even close. And when you get out to the village level, which is where most of the people still live, believe it or not, um, they uh, they often have nothing. But that is hurting the economy as much as the zero COVID. They're, they're, they had no good ways out. I'm not saying one's better than the other. They're both awful. But uh, but you still have a lot of things that are not COVID. The real estate collapse, the excessive debt, the demographic decline, um, just the impact of top-down management where you can't possibly get everything right. You know, and so and decoupling from the U.S. and the U.S. cutting off um, you know high tech exports to China, including their country exports where they're relying on U.S. licenses or equipment. So China's in a deep hole, probably in a recession. Japan, same thing. So so the global economy is in bad shape. Uh, it's going into a recession. Now, a lot of people have said that, um, yeah, 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 we're going to have a recession as if it's no big deal. But they're expecting a mild recession. I see a much more severe recession On the other half, what does this mean for financial markets? And there, um, the best way I've been able to explain it, imagine you're in a, an, an Irish pub 
and you got three Irish storytellers. And I'm part Irish, so I can talk about the Irish, you know, and, and, uh, um, but they're telling three different stories and you got to listen to each one. So there's the Fed story, the market story, and then there's something called reality, what's actually happening. Uh, so stock market's telling us Goldilocks, bond market's telling us, you know, here comes, uh, you know, Hurricane Mitch or whatever. And then, uh, there's what I call the reality. Uh, and I guess I'm a storyteller here, but, um, what I see is, is a kind of a hybrid. The Fed's doing what they're doing, right or wrong. Okay. They're, they're doing what they're doing. The market has their own interpretation. I agree with the market, certainly the bond market, that the Fed has probably over tightened. They probably are at the, um, so-called terminal rate. They just don't know it. They're going to keep going for the reasons I explained. That means they're going to make it worse. They're going to make the recession even worse. Um, and they may pivot, uh, to say that there could be a rate cut. Um, it won't be in April, but you know, rate cut in August. Maybe I wouldn't rule that out, but for a really bad reason. In other words, if the Fed cuts rates, which they may, the pivot may be real. It's not because they engineered a soft landing and Goldilocks and everything. Oh, that's just right. It's because they screwed up as usual as they've been doing since 1913. They over tightened and they found out too late. And then they got to, then they have to slam on the brakes if, or take the foot off the brake, if you will, in terms of rate hikes and then pivot. And we've seen this movie before. This is exactly what happened in 2018. The stock market dropped 20%. I mean, it was like 19.9 or something on the Dow. So maybe not technically a bear market, but yeah, what's the difference? It dropped 20%. The Fed was tightening into that collapse. The Fed tightened on uh, December 16th, 2018, only like eight days before the Christmas Eve massacre. And after most of the 20% collapse had already happened, they tightened one last time. So what it shows you is that when the Fed's on a mission, they they actually don't care about the stock market, this whole, you know, Bernanke put and Greenspan put and all that. That's not how it works. Uh, they don't care that much about this. On yeah, the back I'm of not the alone. Recession. I mean, that is my expectation. I have my own models and I look at it closely. But if you listen to you know, Michael Berry, Jeremy Grantham, uh, you know, Charlie Munger, these people have been around and they run, you know, hundreds of billions and uh, they're saying the same thing. So every now and then someone will throw some statistic at me. And I go, well, how long is your time series? And I go, oh, we took it back five years. I was like, you know, talk to me if you've done it for a hundred years, because that's a little more meaningful. But Jeremy Grantham actually did do a 100 year time series and looked at bubbles all over the world, you know, 1929, US, 1989, Japan, 2000, dot com stocks, you know, and many others. And he said he's never seen anything like it. You know, it's a triple greatest bubble of all time times three in the sense that it's real estate, stocks, and other asset classes. So, uh, yeah, I do, that is my view, but it's shared by a number of other analysts. And that would mean like S&P coming off another 20, 30 percent? Yes. And again, you have to remind people, 1929, yeah, everyone's like, yeah, October, uh, I think the 18th or 19th, it was late October 1929, the stock market fell 22 percent in two days. It wasn't one day, it was, you know, it was like 12 percent one day, 11 percent the next day, so 23 percent over two days. But that wasn't the crash. I mean, that was the beginning of the crash. This Dow Jones fell 82 percent from top to bottom. Now it took two years. It bottomed in uh, June, 1932, started in October, 1929. So not quite three years, but that fell 82%. And that happens. So uh, yeah, we're down, uh, you know, NASDAQ's down, well, bounced back a little bit in recent days, down close to 30%, down the S&P down over 20%. We're in bear market territory, but that's just the beginning. That's not what a full bear market, full, you know, market adjustment looks like in the face of the kind of recession that I expect. Talk to me about inflation, because, you know, I was looking at some of the inflation numbers and you have to go back to the 80s to see anything that's approaching double digit. You know, I remember being just a kid hearing about double digit inflation. I could kind of remember the gas pumps, you know, the lines at the gas. It's like a distant memory of me in the 70s. And but, you know, how do you talk to younger people these days about what inflation is or it means? Because I don't think people really grasp what it actually means to your savings or to the economy in an even a medium term. 
That's exactly right, Brian. And if you, um, you're a little younger than I am, but I lived through it. I was started my career in banking in 1976. And I remember my, uh, my wife and I used to kid each other. She was in advertising. I was in banking and the inflation was so bad. You'd get a raise every like four or five months and you didn't have to ask. They would just give it to you because they knew that you were going to quit if they didn't keep up. So she would get a raise and she was making more than I was at the time. So we'd go out to dinner and, and I would get a raise and I was making more than she was. So we would just tease each other about that. But that's how it was. And the psychology was, you know, if you needed a whatever, you know, a TV set or refrigerator, new car, whatever, you say, I better buy it now because the price is going to be higher. If I wait a month or two months, the price is going to run away from me. So it had huge behavioral effects. Of course, gold was, you know, going to the moon. There was a lot going on at the time. But Brian, you're right when you say we're putting up inflation numbers today that are the highest in 40 years. That is correct. A little 41. Actually, it was 1981 before we saw these numbers. But I remind people, the inflation in 1981 was the end of a 10-year period of inflation. It wasn't the beginning. It's like, oh, that's an inflation. Yeah, we did. But it had started. I mean, in some ways, it started in 1968, and it really took off in 1974-75. So 81, these numbers, that was when Volcker finally got it under control. But you go back to 80, now 70, we do well, between 77 and 81, so that five-year period, the dollar lost 50% of its purchasing power. Not 15, 50 in that five year stretch. So you were putting up numbers, you know, 10%, 11%, 13% and higher year after year. Yeah, 1981, it was, um, you know, nine or 10, which is what they're comparing it to today. But that was on the downslope. It had been higher than that in 77, 78, and, you know, 79. So the question is, is this the beginning of an inflationary surge where it's going to get even worse and it is going to last five years? Or is it different than that? But keep that in mind because the 40-year comparison, it is correct, but that was the tail end of an even worse episode. And again, there is this comparison to the 70s. By the way, I think the situation we're in today is very different from the 1970s, and I'll explain why. In the 70s, it was triggered from the supply side with first the Arab oil embargo in 1973 as a result of the, uh, the 1973 Arab-Israeli war. And then the price tripled, but it went from like $2 to $6. Okay. But, you know, percentage terms, that's a huge jump, but it was still $6. And then it got to 12 And then in 1979, you had a second oil embargo because of Iran and the Ayatollah and the revolution and the hostages and all that. And then it went from kind of 12 to 20 So oil went up by a factor of 10 in the course of the late 70s because of those two different embargoes. So that's coming from the supply side. But what happened was the other source of inflation is on the demand side. So you have what's called cost push inflation. That's where you know supplies choked off or there's an embargo or there's a shortage, of natural disaster, a lot of things. It's coming from the supply side and demand is inelastic. So you just pay up or you know kind of do without. But the demand side is much more psychological. That's called demand pull inflation. That's when consumers behave the way I described. And as I said, I lived in the 70s, um, where, you know, hey, I better buy it today, I better buy it now. You're pulling all this demand forward and bidding up prices because you're worried that it's going to get even worse. So as that applies to today, we are starting with the cost push inflation, you know, mainly the price of energy, but the price of food is a big factor. And of course, they're related. You know, it's like, here's the energy, here's the food. You know, where do you think the food comes from? To get the food, you got to feed the pigs and cows. What do you feed them? You feed them corn. Oh, how do you get corn? Well, you grow it on a farm. You need nitrogen fertilizer. You need diesel in your tractors. You get the food. You got to put it in a truck to get it from point A to point B. That requires diesel. The higher the diesel price, the higher the cost of food because you're moving it by truck, et cetera. So these things, as I say, are linked. But food prices are going up substantially. And you can't, the two things you can't do without. Like, it was on the short list to be nominated to the Board of Governors in Washington to fill the seat that Lael Brainerd left. Lael Brainerd was a um, member of the Board of Governors, I believe she was Vice Chairman, uh, but she left to go to the White House uh, in the National Economic Council. She, but she she really is smart. She's she's a big brain. Like she, she knows what she's talking about. Very few of them do, but she's one of them. But she goes to the White House, but that's an audition for Secretary of the Treasury because they're going to throw Yellen under the bus. Yellen knows nothing. If Yellen were on this call right now, she wouldn't know anything we're talking about. How is that she, possible, Jim? 
affirmative action. She's a, uh, she's a, uh, when she was chairman of the Fed, I said she was incompetent and I was right. And then she became secretary of the treasury. She, she's a, she's a statistics geek from Berkeley. She, uh, she's got a big brain. I'll give her credit on IQ points. So what? That's not the same as common sense or, or working knowledge or knowing how the street works. She's never worked, you know, outside of government in her entire life. I don't care what your resume is. If you've never run a business, met a payroll, um, you know, negotiated a person's sale agreement, um, you know, had kept your morale up with negative cash flow. If you've never done any of those things, um, you don't know what it's like to be in the, in the real world of the economy. She doesn't, but she, but her specialty as an economist was, was labor economics. Okay. Well, there's a place for that, but not, not as U.S. was tre treasury secretary. You have to know much. She didn't know monetary policy of the Fed. She doesn't know fiscal policy of the treasury. There's no, nothing about international economics. And that gets us into the, the role of the dollar. She just, she was like, uh, her husband won a Nobel prize. Okay. George Akerlof. I know a lot of her close associates. Um, she, you know, if you don't want to say affirmative action, you can say the Peter principle. Uh, which, you know, this goes back to the 60s. But the Peter principle is you, you get in a bureaucracy and you do a good job and they give you a promotion. And then you keep doing a good job and they give you another promotion. And you keep doing a good job. And eventually you get to promote it to something where you're incompetent. You're actually, you're in over your head and you fail, but then you stay there because because you're not getting another promotion um and so the result is bureaucracies are populated with incompetent people because they've all risen to their level of incompetence and have nowhere else to go i would say she got there the fed how she got another chance at treasury but that's you know that that's the answer um and uh but but leo brainerd i'll say is uh is more talented and hopefully she'll be so they'll throw you all under the bus blame her that's by the way that's the biden technique deflection and and denial and uh just blaming other people so they'll blame her for the whole thing she probably doesn't see that coming by the way maybe she should tune into london real and then uh, then they'll put little brainerd over there but mary daly was on the short list to fill brainerd's seat at the fed well you can forget that she can't get the hearing at this point but she was um running around on you know climate change uh social justice uh george floyd blm and again free country you want to express if you be my guest but not as chief regulator of silicon valley bank yeah yeah it's uh so should they have let it fail and what would have been the carnage jim if they had well again this hindsight you, it shouldn't have been allowed to get to that place anyway but there might have been more this is where there's a lack of creativity it's kind of all or nothing say like, oh if this fails we're going to have a bunch we're going to have a wave of failures of startups in silicon valley well, that's probably true probably true um but most of them fail anyway <laughs> if you know the venture capital business and i'm sure you do uh most of these things fail anyway a couple of winners here and there well if how difficult would it have been so now you're the entrepreneur you had a five you had five million dollars of working capital which you got in a, a round you know an angel round or whatever from some venture capitalists in silicon valley you got some premises you got a payroll you got some developers you got employees all that stuff and now your cash is frozen not just frozen but gone you got a Look at Yang money, you know, you got a do bill from the FDIC. Um, if those, now who's to say if those companies were well run and they actually had some good technology, how difficult would it have been to make a few phone calls and say, you know what, we're stuck in this thing. Um, I need a, I need a two year bridge loan or I need a one year bridge loan. Uh, and uh, I'll collateralize it by the proceeds of my receivership certificate. And as and when I get paid, I'll pay down the loan. We can have a simultaneous closing. All good. You you could have got money. The, those some of those firms could have got money. Some of them not. Um, maybe some layoffs. Uh, maybe they would have failed. And but most of them do anyway. I mean, that's my first point. But that was not the majority of. And you know, unemployment would have gone up. I mean, I'm not saying that there are no hardships, Brian. But but we gloss over the greater hardships on the economy as a whole and that gets to the other lie which was janet yellen coming out and saying um there's no cost to the taxpayer like wait a second because <laughs> you, you mentioned the bailout of the fed taking the loans below market value and giving them you know uh, yeah uh, so at market value and giving them par value which is more for one year and glossed over that whole thing um but there was a separate bailout, which is the FDIC guaranteed every penny of every deposit in all those banks. Well, when you look at the numbers, you have grossly uh, depleted 
the insurance fund. The FDIC is an insurance company. It's that's what the I stands for. Uh, <laughs> and um, they have reserves, just like every other insurance company. They charge premiums. That's how they go. Uh, this would have basically wiped out the reserves. So how are you going to top up the reserves in the FDIC for future bank failures? Well, they said, we're going to raise premiums on the banks. Okay, they are. But uh, what do the banks do? Well, they're going to either pay you less interest or charge you fees. In other words, that, the bank isn't just going to sit there and write checks to the FDIC and, and watch their P&L evaporate. They're going to pass the cost on to the customer, which is us, which is the American people. So is, does your tax bill go up? No, but your interest rate's going down or your banking fees are going up. So the cost is shifted to everyday Americans. So don't tell me that we're not paying the bill because we are. So again, these are these are in the, the nature of government lies to kind of you know disguise what they're actually doing i uh well i don't have a hundred billion dollars so maybe there maybe there's a level where you got enough money and it's not your primary concern um it, it, you know i like making money but it's not what the first thing i think about when i wake up in the morning the first thing i think about is how do you you know solve problems and what's going on um and you know must seems to have some of that maybe more than a little uh you know, look, if you don't have free speech and you abandon the Constitution, I mean, is this is this like the uh, the fall of the Roman Republic? I mean, it, it, there's a little bit of a um, uncomfortable resemblance. Uh, again, going back to what we said earlier, you got to got to study history. It's not it's, it's certainly not the same, but there's no better playbook for doing analysis and a really good understanding of history. It's why um, today in America and I would say uh, not just communists, but neo-fascists and other forms of dictators and we have plenty of those in washington the one of the first things they kill in the curriculum is history they stop teaching it because if you knew a lot of history you'd see you'd see these things for what they are um but um but i i have some pretty good history teachers and i've always been interested in it so uh yeah i was um i was shocked by what's revealed even though i've been around enough to maybe maybe not be shocked but but just the extent of it and and the depth of it and uh i um have a lot of sympathy for the uh, users who were suppressed and squashed and deplatformed, and even more sympathy for the victims of that kind of censorship. So we were on the front lines of that information war in 2020. And so when I see these files, I see it from a slightly different angle. I mean, April 6, 2020, we had the second largest YouTube live stream in the world that day, Jim. 65,000 wow. concurrent viewers watch me in this studio uh, have a two and a half hour conversation where things were questioned as far as efficacy of a PCR test, masks, future vaccination policies, which were really early. Even origination of the virus might have come out of Wuhan, something they literally almost lock you up if you had mentioned that in April right. of 2020. 30 minutes after that, Jim, for the first time in my nine year history of London Real, a video of mine on YouTube was deleted and banned. And right. I thought, what is going on here? I thought the weirdos are the people that got censored in this world. And then after that, I was subsequently banned, shadow banned from the following platforms, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Dropbox, PayPal, right? With yep. Six figures of balances on PayPal. Dropbox, where I didn't think they were watching my videos. I mean, that's technically right. my information. And Again, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I leave that to the guests on my show that come on because I think they have the right for free speech and we should all listen to what they have to say. But when I saw those Twitter files for the first time, Jim, I thought, okay, if there was a coordinated effort, it would have to come from a single source and why not come from someone who was trying to say, please, can we stop people talking about X? So I saw right. it in a slightly different state to where I was like, oh, okay, now I could see maybe how that coordination could happen. Um, yeah, and, and I, like, I like the way you put it, Brian. You said with with this guest, this particular show, you were questioning things. You weren't being categorical about this. Uh, you say, well, maybe it did come from Wuhan. And it was, that's what you're supposed to do. Um, my my book, the um, the New Great Depression, came out in January 2021. Uh, interestingly, the publication date was supply, was delayed because of the supply chain, which was my next book. But um, I had it pretty much done by the summer 2020. And what strikes me was. The evidence was there then. Now, two years later, you know, you're watching uh, whatever Tucker Carlson or, you know, Alex Berenson or others, I'm sure there are many in the UK, and they're saying, well, you know, did you, do you know that the masks don't work and the lockdowns don't work and this thing looks like it came from Wuhan? I was like, yeah, I do. And 
I said that in 2020, but the point is the evidence was there. It wasn't guesswork. I'll give you a real, real quick example. Um, the leading epidemiologist for virologists of the 20th century, maybe all time, is Dr. D.A. Henderson. Now, D.A. Henderson is not a household name, but if there's a single individual most responsible for eradicating smallpox on the planet Earth, it was D.A. Henderson. He won the Presidential Medal of Freedom, which is our highest civilian honor, equivalent to the Congressional Medal of Honor in the military, um, dean of the uh, Bloomberg Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. I mean, you know, you, you can't go any higher in the profession, have more respect than D.A. Henderson. He wrote a paper in 2005 that said lockdowns don't work. Um, and he had the research to back it up. This was at the time, I believe it was the swine flu was going. There was an avian flu and a swine flu during the Bush administration. Bush was actually very concerned about it. And Henderson wrote this paper, said they don't work. Uh, and I cited that in my book. But the point is, we didn't have to wait until 2021 or 2022, in China's case, you know, today, to find out that lockdowns don't work. In 2020, we had a paper from 2005 that said the same thing. He said, if you have an island and there's no airstrip and only one way in or out and you got a hundred people, maybe, but that's not North America, that's not Europe, that's not the world, they just don't work. Um, well, if we knew that from the leading epidemiologist, maybe of all time, uh, why didn't we follow that advice? Well, the answer was it was a hidden agenda. They they wanted to shut they wanted to shut people down. They wanted to um, uh, basically the the inner we empowered the inner fascists uh, in in all these government bureaucrats. Uh, I mean, it was it, it was Black Scholes, but it was Fisher Black, Myron Scholes, but there was a third contributor. and He won the Nobel Prize, which was uh, Robert C. Merton. Merton, yeah. Uh, Merton was at Harvard, and 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 Fisher and Myron had worked on this for a long time and had come close, but weren't all the way there. They went to Merton to help with the math, actually. And Merton solved the math problem for them, but to his credit, a very generous, another really, really nice guy, uh, he said, look, you guys go ahead and publish this, and then I'll I'll tag along a few months later with my contribution. And the, the Nobel Prize is not awarded posthumously. So Fisher Black sadly died before they got the prize. So Merton and um and Scholes won the prize and again to their credit they pulled the award divided by three and gave one third to Fisher's widow which I thought was very you know appropriate and um uh you know very uh very uh, generous of them but uh yeah it was a math problem you write about what they call Brownian motion which is random and you know so it was sort of you had a a fan, if you will, of probabilities, um, and then you know different um, different degree distributions, some more likely than others, etc. Having said that, um, and you know the success of Myron used to say, you know, Jim, if, if only I had patented the idea <laughs> and had like a fraction of a penny on all the notion of value, I'd be the richest man in the world, which is probably true. Yeah. Um, but they didn't. They they put it in an academic uh, journal, but. Um, uh, there are there are assumptions in Black Scholes which you can question. I'm not dinging the model. Science is always, hey, let's make it better. It doesn't mean you don't use what you have. Um, but uh, they assume a risk-free rate. Well, is there really anything like? Is there a risk-free rate? Is the United States risk-free? I I don't think so actually, and it's getting riskier by the day. So you can kind of question that assumption. Um, does the the future resemble the past with some probability, some degree distribution of probability? Not always. I mean, and maybe less frequently now than ever. And they also assume that prices move continuously. You know, prices go up and down, of course, but that you could get. If it were going up, you could get out of certain levels. If it were going down, you could put stop losses on your position and get out of certain levels. You could manage it. And of course, that was a big contributor to the uh, 1987, uh, October 19th, 1987 flash crash when the market fell 22% in one day i mean today we get worked up if it's down 22 percent a year which it was last year uh, approximately but this is 22 percent in one day but uh, it turns out none of that's true um markets don't move continuously or if they do it's when you don't care when you do care they just gap they get gap down or they gap up you miss it you blink and it's at a completely different level it's been repriced now you can still get in and out but you've either made a lot of money or lost a lot of money you know in the blink of an eye so when you take those characteristics, and this is how I started kind of you know, deconstructing it, if you will, and said, well, look, markets are not efficient. That's nonsense. 
they don't move continuously and slowly. They gap up and they gap down. And if you're not ready for that, you've missed the boat. Um, nothing's risk-free, so why don't we start there? When I started identifying those factors that, in my view, were incorrectly applied um, in long-term capital, but really everywhere, um, and you say, well, what, what looks like that? Well, the answer is a complex dynamic system. You know, a system that produces hurricanes and tornadoes and lightning bolts and power outages and earthquakes and tsunamis. Those are all examples of the results of complex dynamic systems. An earthquake doesn't sneak up on you. It just, you know, it just, <laughs> the ground falls out from under you instantly. Um, and that's what happens in markets. So then I said, well, maybe that's a better model. Of course it, it, it is. So a very good point, Brian. So let's go back to um, uh, Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, the Latin American debt crisis broadly defined in the early 1980s. Th that played out at the intense phase lasted about three years, you know, 82, 83, 84. It wasn't until 1990 that we got around to Brady bonds, which were the ultimate refinancing technique. But the intense period lasted about three years. Come forward to 1998, long-term capital management. That it was about three months. That was uh, July, August, September, 1998. SVB was three days or less. It was like Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and done. Um, and you know, I, I talked to a guy. I know we no uh, reason to mention names, but you know, uh, um, runs runs a very one of the largest uh, endowments uh, in the world. And he said, Jim, we moved. Uh, we we were moving eight billion dollars out of Silicon Valley Bank, and we got the wire transfer request in, but. We didn't know because, you know, you get to close business Thursday. We didn't know until Sunday that the money was going to move. We got a confirmation on Monday. We didn't end up moving the money. But there was this about a 48 hour period there from Friday to Sunday when no one knew that the thing, the wires had been completed. The recipients didn't have them. It was just in limbo. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, and it worked out. Um, one of the big crypto promoters, um, they, um, uh, I forget the name, well, the particular name of the bank, but they backed one of the, uh, um, one of the stable coins, actually it's USDC, yeah. uh, had three, three billion dollars in Silicon Valley Bank. And they talked about, you know, all these small entrepreneurs and startups, they got a hundred employees and five million in working capital and that money's gone and they're all going to fail. There was something to that, but, uh, the fact is you had Roku, uh, uh, Cisco, uh, eBay. I mean, there were huge companies with multi-billion dollar deposits in that bank. It wasn't all, uh, all a bunch of little guys. So, um, but yeah, you can, uh, yeah, in the old days, you have to line up around the, the block and maybe it was raining. You're standing there in the rain waiting for your turn to get up to the tower. Now you can be in line at McDonald's, you know, with your cell phone and just a couple of hits, QR code and boom, uh, you know, $10 million is, is gone. And what Peter Thiel did, uh, and he was right. I mean, I'm not criticizing him. He got his own money up, but he, he sent out like an SOS to Silicon Valley. He said, all of you, whoever you are, get your money out now. Uh, and a lot of, a lot of people did, and that was that $40 billion. So, so the time, the time frame is becoming more, more compressed because of technology. You're exactly right about that, which means that the response function has to be equally compressed or else you are going to have all the consequences of a, you know, an honest to goodness global financial crisis. So, and I'm not sure if everyone knows the sequence, but on Friday night, March 10th, the FDIC, um, took over Silicon Valley Bank. And they issued a press release and they said, here's what we're doing. Um, we're taking it over. Uh, we're putting it into what's called a receivership. Um, anyone with $250,000 or less, your deposits are fully insured. No, no worries. You'll have your money Monday morning and over $250,000, your deposits are gone. They didn't say frozen. They didn't say suspended. They said gone. And they gave you a receivership certificate, basically a, an unsecured printed up IOU from the FDIC, but not money. And it's a receivership certificate. And they said, hang on to them. Uh, in effect, um, we're going to sell assets. Uh, and as and when we realize proceeds from assets, we'll give you something. We'll give you distributions on these things. Don't know how much, don't know when. We'll do the best we can. Remember in the RTC days in the early 90s, uh, they, it took them two years and they were, they were very efficient. I worked with them at the time They we were in their offices when we were sitting on boxes because they didn't even have furniture, but they were doing deals. So they had the right, the right attitude, but that took two years. So, um, uh, and that was it. Well, that's when the, that's when I call the, uh, the billionaire crybabies came out in force. Uh, you know, Bill Ackman, all these guys, Oh, you got to save us. You know, I was like, well, you got to trade on Bill. <laughs> Five billion is not enough. But anyway, they pounded on the White House all weekend. Now here, here's something that very few people, so almost nobody knew at the time except the management although they seem to be asleep at the switch 
everyone's like, yeah, startups, venture capital. There's a lot of truth to that. 97% of the deposits of Silicon Valley Bank were uninsured. And by the way, that's my new metric for assessing banks. You used to look at, you know, working capital and debt equity ratios and, you know, bad, bad assets, governments. There are lots of ways to measure the health of a bank. But the most relevant way right now is, and this is publicly available, take the ratio of uninsured deposits to total deposits. 30% is comfortable. If you're like, I, you know, 70% of my deposits are insured, which means they're not panicky. They're not necessarily going to run for the hills. 30%, okay, uninsured, but I have assets. I have, I have that much cash or more. That's a comfortable ratio. When you get over 50, you're in the danger zone. Well, Silicon Valley Bank was 97% uninsured, which meant all the money was going to run, and it did. So that's a way, if you're looking at these big banks or uh, um, you know any any institution or your own savings institution to to look at it. But um, but Silicon Valley Bank was a climate bank. Were they investing in startups? Yes. Were they investing in technology? Yes. But these were climate. These were green new scam uh, uh, startups looking at, you know, battery technology, uh, you know, the chemi chemistry physics, you know, to try to make a better battery. But not much improvement in the battery in, in 200 years, but uh, they're, they're working on it. Um, you know, wind turbines, uh, you know, other sustainable fuel alternatives, et cetera. Again, I'm not do that if you like, if that's your field of research, but so much is subsidized by the government and then further subsidized by Silicon Valley Bank. And that's where the, that's where the assets were. That's where the loans were by and large. And so the White House is getting hammered, not only because of entrepreneurs, job losses. And by the way, we are in an election cycle here in the United States, yeah. but from the greenies who are extremely powerful. So within, so that was Friday night. So Saturday, everyone's crying to the White House. Sunday night at six o'clock. By the way, mark that on your calendar. Sunday at six p.m. is when they tell you what they're going to do. You know, they, you know, uh, six p.m. Sunday, November twelfth. They came out on, uh, sorry, March twelfth. They came out on uh, Silicon Valley Bank. The following week, nineteenth, that was Credit Suisse. Hey, Brian, so let's go back to um, uh, you know, Brazil, Mexico, Argentina. The Latin American debt crisis, broadly defined in the early nineteen eighties. That, that played out at the intense phase lasted about three years, you know, 82, 83, 84. It wasn't until 1990 that we got around to Brady bonds, which were the ultimate refancy, refinancing technique. But the intense period lasted about three years. Come forward to 1998, long term capital management. That uh, was about three months. That was uh, July, August, September 1998. SVB was three days. Or less. It was like Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and done. Um, and you know, I, I talked to a guy. I know we no reason to mention names, but you know, uh, um, runs runs a very one of the largest uh, endowments uh, in the world. And he said, Jim, we moved. Uh, we we were moving eight billion dollars out of Silicon Valley Bank, and we got the wire transfer request in, but we didn't know because you know you get to close business thursday we didn't know until sunday that the money was going to move we got a confirmation on monday we didn't end up moving the money but there was this about a 48 hour period there from friday to sunday when no one knew that the thing the wires had been completed the recipients didn't have them it was just in limbo um and uh uh you know and it worked out um one of the big crypto promoters um they um uh, I forget the name well the particular name of the bank but they back one of the uh um one of the stable coins actually it's usdc yeah. uh had three three billion dollars in silicon valley bank and they talked about you know all these small entrepreneurs and startups they got 100 employees and five million in working capital and that money's gone and they're all going to fail there was something to that but uh the fact is you had roku uh uh cisco uh ebay i mean there were huge companies with multi-billion dollar deposits in that bank it wasn't all uh all a bunch of little guys so um but yeah you can uh yeah, in the old days you have the lineup around the the block and maybe it was raining you're standing there in the rain waiting for your turn to get up to the tower now you can be in line at mcdonald's you know with your cell phone and just a couple of hits qr code and boom uh you know 10 million dollars is gone and what peter thiel did uh and he was right i mean i'm not criticizing him he got his own money up but he he sent out like an sos to silicon valley he said all of you whoever you are get your money out now uh and a lot of, a lot of people did and that was that 40 billion dollars so so the time the time frame is becoming more more compressed because of technology you're exactly right about that which means that the response function has to be equally compressed or else you are going to have all the consequences of a you know an honest to goodness global financial crisis so and i'm not sure if everyone knows the sequence but on friday night 
March 10th, the FDIC um, took over Silicon Valley Bank and they issued a press release and they said, here's what we're doing. Um, we're taking over, uh, we're putting it into what's called a receivership. Um, anyone with $250,000 or less, your deposits are fully insured, no, no worries, you'll have your money Monday morning. And over $250,000, your deposits are gone. They didn't say frozen, they didn't say suspended, they said gone. And they gave you a receivership certificate, basically a, an unsecured printed up IOU from the FDIC, but not money. And it's a receivership certificate. And they said, hang on to them. Uh, in effect, um, we're going to sell assets. Uh, and as and when we realize proceeds from assets, we'll give you something. We'll give you distributions on these things. Don't know how much. Don't know when. We'll do the best we can. Remember in the RTC days in the early 90s, uh, they, it took them two years and they were, they were very efficient. I worked with them at the time. They, we were in their offices when we were sitting on boxes because they didn't even have furniture, but they were doing deals. So they had the right, the right attitude, but that took two years. So, um, uh, and that was it. Well, that's when the, that's when I call the, uh, the billionaire crybabies came out in force. Uh, you know, Bill Ackman, all these guys, oh, you got to save us. You know, and I was like, well, you got to trade on Bill. <laughs> Five billion is not enough. But anyway, they pounded on the White House all weekend. Now here, here's something that very few people, I say almost nobody knew at the time except the management, although they seem to be asleep at the switch. Everyone's like, yeah, startups, venture capital. And then there's a lot of truth to that. 97% of the deposits of Silicon Valley Bank were uninsured. And by the way, that's my new metric for assessing banks. You used to look at, you know, working capital and debt equity ratios and, you know, bad, bad assets, governments. There are lots of ways to measure the health of a bank. But the most relevant way right now is, and this is publicly available, take the ratio of uninsured deposits to total deposits. 30% is comfortable. If you're like, I guess, you know, 70% of my deposits are insured, which means they're not panicky. They're not necessarily going to run for the hills. 30%, okay, uninsured, but I have assets. I have, I have that much cash or more. That's a comfortable ratio. When you get over 50, you're in the danger zone. Well, Silicon Valley Bank was 97% uninsured which meant all the money was going to run and it did so that's the way if you're looking at these big banks or uh um you know any any institution or your own savings institution to to look at it but um but silicon valley bank was a climate bank were they investing in startups yes were they investing in technology yes but these were climate these were green new scam uh uh, startups looking at, you know, battery technology, uh, you know, the chemi chemistry physics, you know, to try to make a better battery, but not much improvement in the battery in, in 200 years, but, um, uh, there's, they're working on it. Um, you know, wind turbines, uh, you know, other sustainable fuel alternatives, et cetera. Again, I'm not do that if you like, if that's your field of research, but so much is subsidized by the government and then further subsidized by Silicon Valley Bank. And that's where the, that's where the assets were. That's where the loans were by and large. And so the White House is getting hammered, not only because of entrepreneurs, job losses. And by the way, we are in an election cycle here in the United States, yeah. but from the greenies who are extremely powerful. So within, so that was Friday night. So Saturday, everyone's crying to the White House. Sunday night at six o'clock. By the way, mark that on your calendar. Sunday at six p.m. is when they tell you what they're going to do. You know, they, you know, uh, six p.m. Sunday, November twelfth. They came out on, uh, sorry, March twelfth. They came out on uh, Silicon Valley Bank. The following week, nineteenth, that was Credit Suisse. The math and the science behind diversification and why it's a good strategy is very clear. That's not much debate about that. The problem is people don't understand what diversification means. They think if they have 50 stocks in 10 sectors, semiconductors, consumer non durables or whatever, they're diversified. And what I say to them is you may have 50 stocks, but that's one asset class. You're in stocks. And in stressful situations, they become highly correlated. So you're not getting the benefit of diversification. You think you are, but you're not. So what does a diversified portfolio look like? Well, I have a slice of stocks. I'm not anti-stock market, but you got to pick the sectors and the stocks that will perform well, even in the kind of conditions we're talking about. And I would go back to energy, natural resources, agriculture. So, you know, a uh, marathon, Exxon Mobil, Chevron, ADM, uh, cargo, um, uh, you know, uh, mining companies uh and not just gold gold yeah but um i recently invested in a lithium mine uh I, I the green new deal i call it the green new scam uh, and this is a scam but it doesn't mean it doesn't have legs whether it's whether you like it or not the fact is uh it's going to go on so the lithium's in short supply uh graphite you know etc so there is a portfolio you can have which is natural resource oriented that will do well even in the kind of tough environment we're talking about slugger cash absolutely maybe as much as 30 percent 
I like treasury notes, 10 year treasury notes, but you know, season to taste. If, it's, if they're a little too volatile, look at five year notes, two year notes. They're going to come down a lot, not right away, not tomorrow morning, but um, sooner than later because of everything we discussed, which is, uh, you know, recession and interest rates will follow or lag indicator, but that'll happen. Bonds, particularly the, the sovereign bonds, especially the US treasuries, they're looking the best they've seen in, in a long while. and and. You know, relatively recently, some have said it's like the best I've seen in my career. So I'm just curious: does do you find that compelling for the moment in time we're in here? Absolutely. There's a I hate to get too deep in the weeds in terms of bond math, but there's something called a DBO one. DBO one is the dollar value of one basis point. What that means is, you know, obviously, basic bond math: interest rates come down, the value, the price of the bond goes up. They're just invert. It's a little counterintuitive, but the question is how much. And the lower the interest rate the more the price of the bond goes up for every basis point drop in rates. Mm. So in other words, if you go from 9% to 8%, you'll have a nice capital gain on your bond. But if you go from 3% to 2%, it's still a 1% drop, but you're going to have a much bigger capital gain. You know, in, in each instance, it's a 1% drop in rates, but the amount of capital gain on the bond is much higher you know, as the DBO one is higher when the rates are lower. Again, it's all counterintuitive. The lower the rate, the greater the capital gain on each basis point drop in yields. That's the basically. So yeah, when you're you, you go from three percent to two percent, that's a home run in terms of capital gains. So you get the yield, you get the safety, you get the liquidity, and if you feel like selling it, you got a nice fat capital gain. Gold, uh, I always recommend a ten percent slice. But based on what we were talking about, I would get uh, silver dollars, American silver eagles. Yeah, the mo monster box. Uh, you know bit of jargon. Monster Box comes from the U.S. Mint, it's treasury green, nice shade of green. It comes with a compression strap. I recommend don't open it, you know, unless you know, do, do not break except in case of fire. But inside are 500 one ounce American Silver Eagles. That's a lot. They'll feed your family for probably a year. You know, it's, it's a market price, It'd be around ten, twelve thousand uh, dollars $12,000 for a Monster Box. But to me, it's like battery and flashlight. I like them both. And, you know, I talk about gold a lot because it's a, a form of money and um, I do the monetary analysis. Uh, I mean, I do invest in gold mines, but I don't hold myself out as a geologist, but I do think about it from a monetary perspective. And then people always say, Jim, what about silver? What about silver? I'm like, look, if, if gold soars the way I expect, silver's along for the ride. There's, a, there's no, there's not going to be a world of $3,000 gold and $20 silver. That world doesn't exist. If gold's at 3,000, silver's going to be pushing 100. So without giving an exact forecast, uh, silver will be along for the ride. Silver is a little more difficult to analyze because it has industrial applications. Gold really doesn't. Gold's not good for anything except money, but it's the best form of money. Silver can be, is used in a lot of applications. So if you have a recession, it's perhaps the case that the monetary value is going up, but the industrial input value is going down. So it's a little bit more of a mixed bag, but silver is going to do fine. And I do think it's extremely practical because in a world of CBDCs, silver will be a form of spending money. Gold, even the eight gram coin, I mentioned the quarter ounce American Gold Eagle, still 500 bucks. It's like pulling a $500 bill out of your wallet. You know, it's, it's a lot for groceries. Home prices are coming down a little more in some markets than others, but uh, if it's income producing and it's solid and it's a place like, you know, uh, Some place people want to be like Austin or Phoenix or whatever. I mean, I know there 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 there's markets down a little bit right now, but you know it's like buying a a ten year bond. You know, it's got steady monthly income and uh, or certainly farmland, uh, but in income producing real estate, not commercial office buildings, should be a part of a diversified portfolio. Yes, I, I like private equity, and it's you know you got accredited investor issues and uh, finding good deals and good promoters and good management. But you know some good deals in the mining sector um, I like. Uh, well, that 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 would be one. I, mean, I want to talk to you real quickly about the current state of media. I, I just love to hear your thoughts on this because I, I I know this is something that you care about that you've written about a bit, um, and. Uh, and you're playing a role in trying to give people, you know, more accurate, more nutritious, more actionable information than, than what they're able to get from the new sources that they're just directed to by society. Um, if you talk about what they call legacy media, mainstream media, so Washington Post, New York Times, LA Times, NBC, ABC, CBS, MSNBC, right. CNN, that run of characters. The first thing you discover is I know a lot of these people. I've been on all these programs. I've done this for a long time. I spent a lot of time in Washington. I had dinner with most of the, or lunch or whatever, dinner actually more often with most of the names you've heard about. Um, some of them are fine. Some of them are nice. A lot of them are either not that bright 
or I mean, they're good on camera, they need, uh, whatever. They got a desk at the Washington Post. They're not that bright. Or if they've got some degrees, they've been kind of indoctrinated. We're at the point now. Uh, I mean, a lot of these people are 28, 33, 34 years old. There's nothing wrong with that. That's you know good. You're you're in the heart of your career, but that means they graduated from school in uh, you know 2016, 2017, or whatever, um, and they're thoroughly indoctrinated. Uh, I'm, I. I, um, I mean, I went to school when uh, uh, we, learned, we learned it was pretty rigorous. I mean, I, I had one program where the, they graded, you needed a C plus average to graduate, but they graded on a C minus curve. So you're like, well, how do you get it? How do you, how do you even get a C plus if they're writing on a C minus curve? And the answer is people quit. And in, the, in other words, you were, you were trying to struggle to be, I did get an A in partnership taxation, and I'm proud of that. But my, the standards are down. The mission standards are down. Affirmative action takes over. When you get into the classroom, I don't care where you're at, you know, Ivy League, whatever, it's just indoctrination. The market has a way of sorting it out. I mean, if revenues are down, advertising's down, the viewers are down, subscriptions are down, eventually they will go out of business, not overnight. And then new media channels will arise. And, you know, there's a lot of garbage on the internet, but there's a lot of good stuff. And, um, you know, if you want to keep tabs on the war in Ukraine, you have to know where to look. It's not easy, but there are a number of channels with and i'm talking about you know military officers you know colonels you know brigadier generals um people on the ground in ukraine not you know some studio in new york you can find out what's going on but i think my intelligence training is helpful because you have to be very persistent and know how to dig